to Californians. Um, yes, well, thank you all for joining and I'm sure we'll have a few more people stepping in. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the November installment of Photo Book Banter. My name is George Slade and I'm a writer, photographer and consultant based in Minnesota's Twin Cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis. Um, photo Book Banter is an independent self-supporting program featuring photographers and photo book artists who have published two or more books of their work over the past several decades. Um, your contributions to this program are welcome. You can use George-Slade-2 on Venmo to do this very effectively. Um, my guest this evening is Sage Sawyer. Um, Sage is coming to us live from the Boston area, Brookline, right? Yes. Um, and Sage is someone whose work I've known since the latter half of the 1980s. Um, but for some reason, and maybe it's because you were just really, really busy making photographs during that time, but we didn't meet until a couple months ago, sort of officially. Um, and when your when your book um, uh, Perfectible Worlds came out in 2007, I felt like it was like I'd been reunited with someone who I wasn't sure that I'd you know I'd lost track of um, somewhere along the line. Um, before we get started, I just want to mention that we are recording tonight, as you may have heard from the computer voice. Um, but this recording of uh, of Sage and yours truly will join uh, six other past recordings of uh, Vinciani, Stacy Merfar, uh, Tim Soder, Sig Harvey, Sean Records, and Stella Johnson um, on the George Slade Rephotographica YouTube channel. So I'll, I try and remember to um, uh, circulate those, or I will try harder to remember to circulate those um, in the future. Um, as I mentioned, donations are acceptable via Venmo. Upcoming banters include uh, uh, Stuart Rome in December, uh, Javier Tavera in January, and fingers crossed, um, working out final details with Mona Kuhn for February. So that will be very exciting if that happens, and I hope it does. All right, as I mentioned, um, Sage Sawyer is with us. And uh, Sage, I guess the first challenge for me always was, and I had to, the reason, the reason I found your work originally was in this publication of Aperture from 1987, which was focused on mothers and daughters. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of, uh, couple of your pictures in here that have become quite well known. Um, this one, which is, uh, Massachusetts, 1986, sorry. And uh, the other is also fairly well known. And I was working in and around Aperture in New York City at around that time. And um, the first challenge I had was getting the picture researcher for that magazine to tell me how to pronounce your name. And I hope that isn't a challenge for many people. Sage, you can introduce yourself and make sure that you say your name the right way. It's a challenge. It's just, it's pronounced as if it's spelled S-A-W-Y-E-R. So it's just Sawyer. Mm -hmm. like, a, like a woodcutter. Yes. Well, um, we have a bunch of books to go through. Um, Sage, why don't we just... Um, why don't we just kind of get started? Let's bring something up. And um, I'm happy to have people just, you know, chime in and ask questions as I'm showing. I'm just going to show a sort of a few pictures from each book and talk a little about the books as I go. Right. So I'm just going to go to share screen here and hope this, you can tell me if this works. Let me just see. Um, Oops. I can't see anything, can you? No, not yet. Um, when you 
pick a window, do you see the little button in the lower right that says share? Well, I did. Now, now that's oh here, share. Yep. Okay. There we go. There we go. View slideshow. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is um, the book that just came out uh, this early fall, and it was done by Kara Verlag, published by Kara Verlag in Germany. And I had worked with them before on a book about my my mother uh, called Witness to Beauty. And so I knew them and I already had a relationship with them. And um, uh, so this book, uh, a lot of my projects sort of start in it from another project and they grow from there. So it actually, this came out of work that I did in the 1980s and 90s. And this book was published a couple of years ago by Stanley Barker um, and they're in the UK. Um, and so, um, I had done a bunch of work in black and white in the 80s and 90s of people with animals and um, never published it. I, ne I didn't really think that I'd gotten enough. And actually when Gregory Barker got in touch with me a few years ago and said, do you have anything, uh, any vintage work? Because one of their specialties is, is, is publishing vintage work of older photographers. Um, do you have anything else aside from the work that you published in American Scene? And I went back through all these animal pictures and I, I went back through my work and I found a bunch more that at the time I hadn't thought about belonging to this project. And so um, that's how this book came about. And, um, and so anyway, Peaceable Kingdom, um, I started photographing people with animals again around 2008. And, uh, well, As I photographed, it became less and less about people with pets and mm. animals that that shared their home, and more and more about people who who are uh, have other kinds of caring relationships with animals, and mm -hmm. especially people who rescue animals of all different sorts. Um, and well, so, um, you, you sort of you sort of revolve around around certain broad but intimate themes. It seems to me. There's, there's in in um, in the animals and peaceable kingdom, um, same sex couples. I mean, there's there's all of this really beautiful attachment moments like what we're looking at right here. Um, well, aside from really being, you know, having grown up with animals and really being into into animals myself, um, I've what I've found over the years is that it's it's a lot easier for me to photograph people if they're um, showing off or if they're with something or someone that they really care about. Mm -hmm. So in the case of my, my at home with themselves, same sex couples project, that was they were with their significant other. In the case of um, uh, people with animals, they're with this, this creature that they love or, and care about. Um, in the case of perfectible worlds, it's about a creation that they've made. Um, right. So um, I don't mean to really equate all those things, but it's it makes it easier than just doing a portrait of someone's face. And right, the, and you've never you've never conscious. You've never thought of yourself really as a portrait artist. Not really. It's been more like portraits within the environment, and so uh, the environment is often just as important um, in a lot of my pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a skunk rescue in Florida. Um, but, you know, I love the fact that the greyhound will just lie there and accept the skunks. The, the greyhound is almost camouflaged. The yeah. skunks are, are so noticeable, but the, the greyhound is like one of the surprises that occasionally pop up in your photographs. I mean, the, the way you photographed with enough light filling in flash and whatnot details certain surface. Um, but it takes a little while. They're not always immediately apparent. Yeah. So um, this was a, a um, the pig, something called the pig preserve in Tennessee um, that and someone else, you know, a lot of these are word of mouth. I, I'd photograph one rescue and they'd tell me about something else in a different state. And then I'd go do that. And, and when I, you know, if I had two or three uh, rescues that I was going to in Tennessee and Georgia say I would then look on go online and find all these other rescues and get in touch with them and let them know what I was doing and um, 
some of some of those you'd go to and they just were in kind of a sorry state and I couldn't use the pictures for them. But for the most part, um, I met a lot of wonderful, wonderful refuges and rescues. Um, this is actually uh, an alpaca um, farm. It's someone who has alpacas and shears them. It's not a rescue. She's, she case. looks like she needs to be rescued at this point. <laughs> Yeah, there could there's there's always that element. <laughs> um, so, and this is a man who um, had an accident when he was young, and uh, got a prosthetic leg, and then went into the prosthesis business. Ended up making a lot of money making um, skin that really felt and looked like skin for people, and he made enough money that eventually he could do what he wanted to. And he decided what he really wanted to do was to make prosthetic limbs for farm animals. Mm -hmm. So he goes around in his van, he goes all over to all these farm rescues that are all over the country and um, makes these custom prosthetics for animals. And this is his donkey, Luigi. Um, this is a turtle rescue in Marathon, Florida, where they do, um, you know, they were removing these tumors um, these sea turtles get tumors from basically they're, they're supposed to eat conch. That's their food. Um, but they they eat a lot of other garbage now. And so unfortunately they get these growths that need to be removed or they really take over their, their, um, blood supply. Mm. And this is a woman who rescues big cats who, you know, that have been in zoos, small zoos, or, you know, they're cats that have been in captivity already and she has about uh, 15 of them on her property. This is Charlie Cheetah. And this is someone who rescues um, cockatoos and, and large birds. So I thought maybe the next thing that I should talk about is uh, Perfectible Worlds, which, which is my first book that was done in uh, 2007. And, mm -hmm. um, Basically, what happened is I entered a, a contest that was through Photo Lucid. I think it was called Critical Mass, and mm -hmm. it mine was one of the winning um, projects. And so they did a book of it. And Chris Rauschenberg, who has done, had started Blue Sky Gallery and um, uh, was, I think, started Photo Lucida too. Um, he basically did the design and it got sent to China. And so I went to China for my first, alone <laughs> for my mm -hmm. first book. And it was definitely like losing my virginity. There was no question <laughs> about it. It's like, you know, shocking. And, um, but what the good thing is that afterwards it's easier to do books after that. So um, it, uh, it's a very simple, small book, but I'm, I'm happy with it. And, after that, I got the book bug in me. <laughs> so, um, and so there, I had all these projects starting from the 80s that had never been published. Mm -hmm. And I and kind the, of always been in a hurry to move on to the next project. The, um, the, the work that you published in this book came pretty tightly before it. In other words, you, you shot from roughly 2001 to 2006 yes. and submitted to Photo Lucida. Photo Lucida and the critical mass jury decided that you were one of the book awardees and right. this came out in a fair, fairly short matter right that's true yes yes that's true um and so it actually it started here with this is my friend jeffrey in his basement in newton um and it turned out for years he'd been uh he'd had this this miniature train set and he'd been adding and adding to it and um I was amazed when I went down. I'd never, I hadn't seen it for years. And, uh, and so I ended up making most of these on a tripod, long exposures, but I wanted to show, um, this, was, this was a month after 9-11. So it basically was, I thought, oh, this is interesting. It's a world that someone can control. You know, our world's out of control, but in his basement, he's in full control of everything. So it started here and then it went to, um, this is a son of a friend, Wesley, um, who, uh, this is his miniature Kandahar. And um, he had painted, he had painted the soldiers and, you know, in camouflage and uh, he had, he had made this world. And actually it's interesting, he's gone on to, um, he just recently published a book um, called The Hardest Place. 
um, the military in Af about the military in Afghanistan, and he's become a military affairs reporter. So it, mm -hmm. it really interests me when you follow people over time. What happens to people? You know, you see their interest, and you know, often one thing leads to another, and uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, anyway, so at first it started with these miniature worlds, and then. I got interested, they seem to be getting a little repetitive. So I, I thought about bodily perfections, you know, what, what are they like people with lots of tattoos or bodybuilders? Um, this is a bodybuilding competition in Worcester where someone's put on tanning lotion everywhere except his face. And this is another miniature, it's a, but someone's cat jumped into the dollhouse that she had made and was, was moving around and I just, you know, it's, you can see it's a long exposure, but it was, I just, I love what happened with the scale and how that mm -hmm. miniature corgi looks endangered. Mm -hmm. um, a man, this is a man rep repairing a miniature barn. It's, a, it's actually at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont. And uh, this is a girl being prepared for a horse show. So, you know, I, Basically, the book became not just miniatures, not just collections, but the idea of perfecting something, whether it's, um, you know, writing or, you know, it's, a, it's about passions and obsessions, basically. They, they have to work on the shoes here. The shoes yeah. aren't quite perfect yet. Not, no, but I'm not sure. I, think, I assume they put on um, riding boots, but I, I don't remember. Let's hope so. Um, yes. <laughs> And so anyway, then um, in 2012, a few years later, um, I had just completed another project um, that I worked on from uh, 2007 to 2011. And, um, but it came, interestingly, so back in the 90s, I had been working with surgeons at Mass Ioneer, and I had photographed, they were doing um, free flap surgery, which is these radical surgeries for people who have facial cancers and they were taking bones from their legs and putting new jaws on people. And I was trying to do sequences of before, during, before surgery, during surgery and after surgery, preferably with their families. And so there were sequences of maybe three to seven photographs. And I was very interested in it, but it turned out some people loved it and some people absolutely could not look at these pictures, even though they were black and white, you know, the blood wasn't red and all that. Nonetheless, they were, they were tough pictures. And so um, I ended up putting those back in a box and thinking, oh, well, that's too bad. It's a failed project. So a few years later in 2007, the same doctors called me back and said, we're working with a different population now and it's people who have partial facial paralysis and you might really be interested. And I thought, I don't know, I, you know, my husband had just died the year be before in a, in a hospital. And I thought the last thing I want to do is go back to a hospital, but they said, we could really use your, your help with our website. And I, I owed them. I had spent years with them before photographing. And so I went and I, very quickly became fascinated um, with, um, you know, these are people who have Bell's palsy. In some cases, they have tumors. In some cases, it's congenital nerve damage. In some cases, it's accidents. Um, from all different causes, they have partial facial paralysis. And I became extremely interested in almost like there's a, like two expressions in one portrait. Um, and I, this was done in a doctor's office with a backdrop, with a seamless backdrop. So this work is a departure from what I usually do, a total departure, really. Um, it's, it's interestingly timed after Perfectible Worlds, where you talked about things being in control. Here, mm -hmm. everything is out of control. That's true. Everything is very out of control. Um, yeah, and usually... Well, I, you know, I usually work on two or three projects at, a, at the same time. So I learned when I was young, I, I used to just work on one project at a time. And that was bad for me because sometimes it was going great and sometimes it wasn't going well. And then I would get depressed and it was terrible. So I learned that if I, if I had two or three things going at the same time, at least one of them would usually, you know, really be grabbing me at that particular moment. Um, and so, um, you know, when, when I was doing Perfectible Worlds, I was also working on the 
the book about my mother. And um, when I was working on this, I was also working on Peaceable Kingdom about people with animals. So it's, 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 um, they're intertwined. Yeah, they're, they're all intertwined in a way. Um, so one of the things that I discovered is that some of my favorite pictures were of the person who had facial paralysis with their loved ones, with their support, whether it was a, a sibling or a parent or um, whatever. I think it really helped soften the pictures and make people feel that, you know, here this person is loved and it's not um, just this dire thing that's going on. In, um, in Sage, in looking back, um, is this was this one of the harder books for you to make? Or it was a hard book. It was a hard thing to photograph. It was because people were in such pain about how they looked. And mm -hmm. you know, even people with Bell's palsy who weren't, you know, actually at risk in terms of their health. Um, you know, it's a it's a terrible insult not to be able to smile the way we're used to showing emotions through our faces and mm -hmm. being able to do it freely. And suddenly not to be able to do it is really awful. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I would sort of basically sit and listen to people and then have a few minutes to photograph them. And I, it was very hard at the end. I was very tired at the end of the day. It was very hard. It was like, you know, hearing a lot of, a lot of people's pain. Mm -hmm. And also thinking, you know, and I'm and I'm photographing them and they, you know, what they don't like is how they look. But what I started to really, what I found moving is how they presented themselves to the camera. And that despite their pain and how they felt about how they looked, there was a, I don't know, you can see the person there and the pride behind that. And um, I, I just sort of felt like that was um, that was worth that was worth doing, mm -hmm. and I've actually gotten a lot of emails from people with facial paralysis who found this work or found the book who thanked me for doing it, and which has made me feel you know like you know better about it too. Um, so that's been very interesting. Um, we have a, a comment from Stuart Clipper um, who mentions that the uh, a asymmetry of these visages echo with the traditional mask of the Yupik people. Oh, interesting. Yep. Very interesting. Yeah, I can't, for some reason, I can't see the chat here just because I'm looking at the, the pictures rather than the, so if, yeah, if you can let me know what, what any, if anyone sure. asks a question too. Yeah. And this, this book was published 2012 by Columbia College Chicago, right? Yeah, and and it, um, they did a beautiful job. It was basically a nonprofit press, and um, you know they they really did a beautiful job on it. Um, unfortunately, they went out of business right out. I mean, I there were all these people lined up who, who to have their books done, and mine got done, and a lot of other people's didn't. But it meant that it didn't get publicized very well, and um, I, you know, I ended up with a lot of copies that that didn't sell. So mm -hmm. that was too bad. But I was ha also happy to have the book done, and um, they really did a, a gorgeous job. Now, did um, Columbia College didn't go out of business. No, no, the press did. Excuse right. me. Yeah, yeah. No, the the uh, the their, the press did, and and um, anyway. So yes, excellent. So um, then in, in 2014, um, tell me if I'm if I'm going too fast, George, or if there's something, anything I'm missing here. No, no, we can, you're doing great. And also if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, uh, please do. Um, so in 2014, I uh, I self-published this work that I had done in the 80s. I'd done this from 86 to 88 and uh, photographs of same-sex couples. And um, I, had, I, had, I hadn't been able to, to publish this work um, back in the, in the late 80s. Um, and uh, I think that, um, I don't know, it was, first of all, it was harder to publish books back then. Um, I think pu more publishers were doing runs of 5,000 books or 7,500 books. So you really, they really had to feel they could sell a lot of books. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice that now there are these, these photo book presses that 
do smaller runs and it's made mm -hmm. it possible for a lot of people to publish photo books who who might not have been able to before um but anyway i decided to self-publish this because blue sky gallery got in touch with me and said we'd like to show this work because there's this marriage initiative same-sex marriage initiative pending in oregon in November and could we show it in October? And this was, I don't know, April or May at this point. And I thought that's great. And it turned out there were a bunch of marriage initiatives pending in a lot of states. And I thought, wow, this is really, would really be a great time to um, publish this um, and kind of missed its moment in the eighties and nineties. But um, now the work has this historical context which is really very interesting. And, and you were and so, able to do some, some wonderful updates too. I did. Yeah, I rephotographed people in actually I had rephotographed people like in 20, 2002, I guess. So some of the same people um, 10 or 12 years later, um, or actually it was 15 years later. Um, and so um, uh, I, I, I approached a few publishers quickly to see if they could do it. And if there were people who were interested, but said, forget it, we can't do it in that time frame. And I wanted to have the, it as a catalog to um, sell or give out during the um, exhibition. Um, and so I ended up just doing it through blurb. And I do a lot of my, I do a lot of blurb mock-ups before I publish a book. I will do it on blurb to make sure it works. And I'll do a mm -hmm. few different blurb, you know, incarnations of it. And it really helps me to see if I think it works as a book or not. Right. Um, and so I in like this case, it. sorry. Oh, I, I like to refer to um, that process as uh, making a dummy, creating a dummy for a dummy. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's weird because, you know, you look at it on your, you know, your bed or your floor and you look at it, then you make a PDF and you look at it on the screen. You'd think you'd be able to tell if it works, right? No. So no. Somehow you get the blurb book back and immediately you can see what's wrong with uh you know where you made a mistake what's what what where the sequence yeah. doesn't work the, uh, um, the the glance of that little girl is so amazing i mean that makes the whole cover doesn't it and then you find the yeah. hungry jack box a moment or two later yeah um so this was in the 80s before um there were you that before people could get married legally but they were still having um, gay marriages, holy unions, they call sometimes called them. Um, and there was, a, this was when a lot of men in the 80s were dying of AIDS. And this is um, two men with, uh, who lived with, uh, one, this is Gordon and Jim with Gordon's mother. So they lived in back-to-back -back trailers with the mother. Jean and Elaine. So, so basically I did this, this book and I wish I'd gotten someone to design it. Basically I, I, Kent and I designed it together. Kent is um, my wonderful friend who um, does a lot of digital um, work for me and um, is amazing. He does, he does a lot of um, beautiful printing for P for photographers and a lot of digital work for a lot of different photographers. Um, so we just did it quickly together on the fly. And then we had 200 copies printed um, by blurb so that we could sell them for, you know, $35 a piece or something. Yep. And um, I've sent them all over the world. It's been very, very successful. Um, but you know, you have to package and send them yourself if you sell. Mm -hmm. So that's the downside. Um, um question how did you find these couples and gain their trust um well this is you know pre-internet um and so it was mostly um word of mouth friends friends of friends um going to um tea dances um meeting you know photographing people and then you'd get into their network of friends You'd send them pictures afterwards, and then you'd have their network of friends, potentially of people who might be willing to be photographed and interested. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was it was different back then. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So this is, I guess this book was published in 2016. And this was done by Kara Verlag, who did my recent book, um, Peaceable Kingdom. And so um, they did a beautiful job on it. Um, and it's, a, it's quite different also from my other projects because it's a book about my mother as she ages. And she had been a, uh, briefly been a fashion model in the 1940s. And so um, I took a picture of her, took this picture in 1994, and I knew I liked it. And, you know, it's, it's sort of the mirror, mirror on the wall picture. And, um, you know, I thought, well, I don't, but I couldn't see what it was part of. And I had never really photographed myself or my family. And I was teaching at the time and I was telling my students, you know, well, photograph what you know, and I was urging them to photograph their families. And I thought, well, I should photograph my family. And I had actually been trying to photograph um, people with their aging parents. And I was doing these portraits um, and they, which were really dull. I just thought, well, I can't make this work. And so as part of that, I thought, well, I should do some self portraits with my mother. And so I was going down to Washington in February of 2000 and I, um, after this was in 94, but I, I guess I don't have the early ones from 2000. Well, I took a couple of pictures that I liked at that point. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I suddenly thought, oh, this is the project I want to do. Not about other people's families. I want to do it about me and my mother. And so what this ended up being is, uh, it's really a, more about, um, memories of, things from childhood and adolescence and memories of family albums. We had, my mother had all these albums and I used to sit next to her making my own albums. She'd give me, you know, sort of cast off pictures and I would, I would sit next to her and we'd make these albums together. And um, so one of the things, so I, we, my sister and, and my mother and I, we sort of did this collaboration where we tried to think of things that would be fun to photograph. And so one of them was, shopping you know we would go to lord and taylor and we'd all go in the same dressing room and we'd be trying on so this is a recreation of that and you know i've left the tripod in the picture as a kind of character in the in the photograph um this is my mother in her garden um and she she really does dress that way when she gardens. She doesn't change her clothes like most of us and wear jeans. You know, Sage, I think it's really interesting. Oh, there's the three of you. Yeah. Um, that that you put um, that very first picture we saw of your mom looking in the mirror in the mirror. Um, that photograph was in Perfectible Worlds. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. A lot of these pictures end up in other projects, too. So, yeah, that's a good and, point. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm intrigued that, that that was several years before the first pictures from Perfectible World. So it's sort of as if the idea of perfection had planted itself in your head and how would, how would someone go about managing control of that world? Right, right, exactly. Um, so this is bleaching ritual. I remembered that, you know, we used to, uh, my mother would look at us and she'd look and she'd say, or she'd, you know, there'd be a little hair coming in and she'd, sweetie, it's time. And we'd get, we'd get out the towels and the Jolene clean, uh, cream bleach and we'd put on the kitchen timer and we'd sit there. And so we recreated this and um, for the, for the camera. So most of these are on tripod, um, natural light tripod, you know, we have to hold the exposure and we discuss what we're going to do beforehand. And then I, I set up the camera. I was still photographing with a film camera here. It was a Mamiya 7 that I was photo using and set it up and I run into the picture. This was my mother on an eco cruise uh, looking at dolphins uh, at 6 a.m. And what I love, I, I feel like she looks younger than ever here, even though she's she doesn't like this picture because she didn't have her makeup on yet. So she said, well, my face wasn't on yet, sweetie. So um, this is cedar enzyme bath. Um, it was um, my sister's on the right there and I took some pictures of both of them and I tried to do it too, but I couldn't get in and out of the cedar enzyme bath uh, quickly enough to, um, 
to you to do it. So mm. I can't say that looks appealing. You know, it actually um, they said they they said they were very relaxed afterwards. I mean, it does mm. look like being buried alive, right? But <laughs> it, yeah. apparently it's, it's warm and um, they said it was actually very relaxing. Mm which was good since I'd asked them to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't have to feel too bad. Um, so, um, and this is uh, a memory of my mother always insisting that we wear bathing caps when we were kids so that our hair would stay just so. And so as adults, she's always offering us um, shower caps. And usually we're like, no, 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 that's okay. But in this case, I'm like, yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So the year after I did the book on my mother, um, this book came out, American Scene, and this is really my earliest work um, from the 19, starting in 79 actually, but from the 1980s. And uh, what happened was um, Joseph Bellows, who has a gallery um, out in San Diego, um, uh, saw the work in a book and contacted me and so, so he saw, saw a few pictures and he wanted to see, you know, my other work. And I, I sent him a bunch of prints and he then showed them to uh, Chris Pickler who runs Nazraeli Press. And, um, and Chris Pickler decided he wanted to do a book of the work. Um, and um, part of also the other thing that had happened is that Mark Steinmetz um, had done a something on called Off the Radar, Mark Steinmetz on Nine Women Photographers of the Northeast. And he'd done that on Time's uh, Lightbox. And I was one of the lucky women that he, that he mentioned, whose work he mentioned. And so I think that had attracted the attention of Chris Pickler and, and Joseph Bellows too. And so this was the first book that I didn't beat down doors to, to get done. I, it just sort of happened where they approached me and said, you know, Joseph Bello showed it to Pickler and, and they said, we'd like to do this book. And it was hard to believe because it doesn't usually happen this way in, in my experience. Um, it's usually just a lot and of- The other thing that doesn't, that, yeah, that doesn't usually happen is that the sequence that you created is the sequence that they used. That's true too. Yeah. Cause, cause Chris said, he, you know, I sent him a sequence. I, and I love work. It's one of the, th my pleasures is to work on the sequence on my, I use my guest bedroom with, I put it on the bed on the, and it falls over onto the floor. I'm very old school the way I do it. And I move things around and I try to pair, try pairs. And I had gotten it to the point where I thought it was pretty good before I sent it to him. And um, he only changed a few things. And he said, you know, he said, usually photographers are the worst editors of their own work. And so I took that as a compliment. And I thought, <laughs> well, one of the things you know, I'm probably not as good a photographer as I get older as I was when I was young. I'm not as quick, um, but I think I'm a better editor. I think I understand how to sequence things, how to make a book, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think I, I can do that better. So well, you, had, um, you had almost 30 years of perspective on this. Yes, I did. Yeah. And that's one thing, you know, it's interesting to see Lee Friedlander's books because he usually doesn't do um, books that he's, you know, he, he, he has work, he goes back and it, he grabs work from all different years. Right. And I think there's something to that, not to try to do work that you've just done because you really don't have a perspective on it. Yeah. He's, he's, he's extremely uh, adept at mining the archives. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And, he, and his archives are vast. That's the other thing. Yeah. Yep. When you photograph yeah. everything, it takes a while to get books made of all of it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Anyway, so this, um, this was um, work that I did in the, in the 80s, wandering around, finding people, um, hanging out on the streets. This was someone I saw from down below and uh, you know, he was leaning out the window and I saw the pigeon on the, and I, and I yelled up and it actually, and then we recreated it once I got up, up upstairs. Yeah. Well, the, you, you make some wonderful comments in, in American scene also, and you talk about how in pre GPS days, you enjoyed the adventure of getting lost and how these are not, these are not Boston pictures by any means. These are all over the country. 
Right, right. That's a Boston picture. That's Boston. Actually, this is Boston too. Oh. But, um, And this is Fall River, Massachusetts. But yeah, I was all over the country. I was I, in a lot of different places. Um, and this kind of work was was definitely easier to do back then because more people, you know, people weren't, kids weren't glued to their screens. They weren't inside, they were outside, um, mm -hmm. hanging out, playing and... Um, yeah, you refer to it as the theater of the streets. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was... Um, I mean, it's it's sad now how how little I mean, now it's interesting with the pandemic, more people are outside again or were last summer. You know, it was it was a but but usually people are um, inside. No one wants outdoor space anymore. It's it's very interesting to me. This is a Mormon family out in Utah. And this was in. Um, Indiana. Uh, I went out for a friend's wedding out in St. Louis and then just took a few days to drive around. So, I, you know, I, wherever I was, I tried to just, you know, rent a car and be able to, to drive around and then walk around different neighborhoods. I, I hesitate to think what that road in the backdrop looks like now. Yeah, it's all developed, I'm sure. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. You, can see the, you can see the edge of the prairie or rather the edge of uh, the suburbs. Yeah, it's one it's one endless development. I mean, it's interesting because I grew up in Virginia outside of DC and I went, I was driving around there a few years ago and there was a whole city, uh, Tyson City, where, you know, that had been just where where we had ridden horses when I was a kid. I mean, mm. it, was, it was just, it was this huge city with skyscrapers. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very bizarre. This is yeah. in South, South Boston again. I'd just like to invite anyone who's who's interested in chiming in in the moment to open up your, I can open up all the microphones or you can unmute yourself um, and just join us in the conversation. Sage, I, is there a lot more material that we have to go through? I don't think through? so. I, I, uh, okay. I guess there's a few from, uh, from animals. Yeah, these okay. are, there's a few from animals, which is the my black and white work from the eighties and nineties, but, um, I'd rather just, you know, talk about books with anyone who has a question or a comment. So, so six different publishers for these seven books that you've done. Um, have have you have you become a, a master of negotiations or how did <laughs> no how... <laughs> no no I mean, not at all. I'm just very persistent and I don't mind. You know, it like no doesn't mean no. It just it's like okay, that person said no, so I'll go to the next. You know. I mean, you got to be a little bit um, thick-skinned, really. You know, right. unfortunately, to to publish so, a book. But Nasrilli was really the only one that has sought you out, or did Stanley Barker kind of go for that? Stanley Barker sought that? me out, yeah. But although they didn't know, they just sort of said, "What what else might you have in your in your archive?" And mm -hmm. um, but they sought me out, and and um, Nasrilli sought me out. Um, but no, otherwise, it's been you know approaching people and um and i'm actually now working on a book of someone else's work with stanley barker um my friend joan albert who photographed her children and a bunch of and did a bunch of family work um she, who died she died about 10 years ago and um stanley barker's doing uh, and i are doing a book of 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 her work and it's it's really beautiful and it should come out um in the spring it's going to be printed in december or january Mm -hmm. So, um, but um, mm -hmm. any questions or comments? Feel free to unmute yourself and there's somebody, no? Yes, Sage, I, I, Doug, I hi. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Um, it really, I, I, I can't recall if I'd seen the, uh, the book of the gay couples before, but what it made me think about was an article from my alumni magazine in the last year or so about 
being gay at that school over the last sort of six to seven decades mm. and trying to give a little retrospective on how things shifted over time. So given that, that you know, the 80s is getting into the domain of 40 years ago, uh, that kind of arc of experience that we have and, and what, what has been, what were some of the things that you gleaned from that process about what it was like at that time and how things have evolved since? Oh yeah, they've, I mean, it, it's, I mean, that's one of the things, you know, usually things don't change so, so quickly. And that's one of the amazing, I think, stories is, um, you know, that, that be, being in a gay relationship really is accepted all over the country, you know, not, not everyone, but I mean, it's, it's become um, accepted and gay marriage has been, has been accepted too. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, usually there's a, there's a longer time frame for change. And of course, you know, things go forward and then they go backward. It's like race relations in this country. They seem to be going forward and then suddenly you realize, whoops, not so fast, you know. Um, but um, yeah, and I think it, it was interesting to publish the, the book um, that much later because it sort of showed that. It showed how different things were back then and um, how, how far things had, had come. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was... That was pretty interesting. Well, one of the really things, cool. one of the things that that book makes me think of is is that um, so often, I mean, your your pictures are often begging for explanation. You know that there are stories behind every almost every single one, and the the interviews with the couples um, in you know the gay couples is are so illuminating, I think, especially when you can look backwards from 2002. But I, I, I know that you've said that you, you try to keep captions in the back sections of the book. Right. Not, not always, but um, usually um, one of the things that I did that I, that I meant to mention actually with this is that I interviewed all the couples <laughs> and I included the interviews in the back of the book. Um, and I felt it was very important at the time to contextualize the work. Um, and I, I, I felt like it really added to the story. I mean, you know, a photograph is this single moment in time and it, it tells you, um, I mean, hopefully it's powerful, but it doesn't tell you that much about who these people are. And I think from an interview, you, you gain a lot more insight and I also did that with Perfectible Worlds. Um, I, I interviewed, you know, some of the people about about their creations, and and um, and I also did it with recently with um, Peaceable Kingdom. I interviewed some of the res people who rescue, so that you could get some sense. If you're interested in the back of the book, there's there's stories about, you know, how did people get into this? I mean, how did this person who you know, saves tigers get into this. Um, and um, so. That makes me think for a second, Sage, of providing a way for people to get access to your books, to order. Can they connect with you directly if they want to? Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, okay. through my website, uh, which is right. just sagesire.com. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, you know, if, if, some of the books I sell directly from my website. Most of them I can tell you where to where to buy them. Right. Um, so, we had a we had a question earlier from Melissa um, about rescue animals. Yeah. Um, let me actually let me get off the share thing here so I can see people better. Stop okay. share. There. Okay. There we are. Now, okay. So here we go. Um, Rescued from where? Yeah, well, good question. Uh, actually, all different places. Um, so, you know, some like, oh gosh. So like the pig preserve, um, you know, some of the pigs they got had fallen off trucks on the way to slaughter, you know. And uh, the others um, were, they started doing, uh, saving pot-bellied pigs um, and pe that people didn't want as pets anymore. There was, you know, there are these crazes that you know of exotic animals and 
you know, for a while, everyone was getting a pot belly pig. And then they realized, well, no, actually, maybe we don't want this pig. It's actually getting a whole lot bigger than we expected. So, mm -hmm. so they were, they were starting to take in all these pigs and then they got interested in farm pigs and they became vegan. It's very hard to be vegan in parts of Tennessee. They tend um, to make pigs of themselves. What? They tend to make pigs of themselves. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yes, I was they wondering do. about the cockatoos specifically. Oh, um, yeah. So, so that woman, um, she, she had a few of, of her own. And then people started just leaving them on her doorstep. She had this huge garden in Key West where with a lot of trees and, and um, so people started, she, you know, they left one and then she took it and then it became kind of, the word went around, you know, this is a woman, this is Nancy who will take your bird if you don't want your bird. And so the, the problem that she has run into is that she's now in her seventies and, um, what happens when she dies? She needs to, to will these birds to someone. And so she's had to find other rescues where the birds will go when she becomes too old or ill or when she dies. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a quandary for people. Melissa, were you wondering about the notion of rescue? Just what does it mean to rescue? I mean, I've, I've wondered about that myself. You know, are we, what are the, we're rescuing the animals from what? Well, well, I know sometimes it's from abandonment or abuse or just, um, you know, like on Maui, for instance, there's hundreds of cats that random people kind of take charge of feeding. Um, but that's what I, I mean, the birds and the pigs seem a little more unusual, more um, unexpected. Yeah. And mm -hmm. like the skunks, for instance, um, oh, right. were, were skunks that were bred to be for the pet trade. And you know they were descented and stuff, but people again, it was sort of a fad. You know, oh, let's get this skunk. How cool, you know. And then they realize, oh, I don't actually want a skunk. Of course, people decide that with dogs and cats too. But it's right. more apt to happen with an exotic animal that they think, you know, this isn't a good idea. I don't want this animal. So they would take this this mom and pop um, organization, basically would just take them in their home and rehome them they would keep them as long as they needed to and then find other pe other people who wanted them as a pet so so what what is the story behind the, the monkeys well those monkeys were um they were rescued again it, they were raised for the pet they were you know imported or raised for the pet trade and this is a woman who took ones that did that people didn't want anymore and would she would look around and find homes for them so that was the same thing. But, you know, there were other people who, um, you know, some animals were uh, used for uh, movies like the, okay, these, um, the one on the cover. Uh, so this is a, a, is, a, is a baboon who was in the movies with, um, and she was with two other um, baboons and they were picking on her. So she was very unhappy and started picking at herself and stuff. And so she was rescued by this organization um, and she's very happy. She's the only baboon and she, she likes to hug all the capuchin monkeys there and stuff. So in that case, she was, you know, she was raised and, and in, a, in something that, that wasn't working for her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's that, that concept of, of rescuing a creature from an abusive environment yeah. Um, I think there's also, though, interestingly, there are organizations called like Corgi Rescue or, or Boston Terrier Rescue, you know, where people maybe got into the, the thrill of a breed and then realized that it just wasn't for them. Well, or just they, you know, people fall on hard times. They suddenly realize they can't afford this animal. They, they are renting and, they, and they're told that, you know, we're sorry we don't take dogs in this apartment. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why mm -hmm. people have to give up animals, unfortunately, so. Right. Or they had to go back to work after the pandemic. <laughs> exactly, yeah, all those, all those people who got pandemic puppies and, and kittens. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. 
Sage, can I ask you about, um, uh, it's wonderful to see the, the scope wow. of your work and, and, uh, um, and all these wonderful books. And you've been making books during a period when the photo book phenomenon has really been expanding and growing in a lot of interesting ways. And I wonder if you have thoughts about that, if you think it's sustainable. It seems like, like photo books have been weathering the pandemic so far, finding ways to still be circulated and uh, um, uh, bought yes. and sold, but um, do you do you see um, in, in the time that you've been making books with in so many different ways, do you um, have any thoughts about about the photo book phenomenon and its future? Gosh, I don't know. You know, I know that galleries, uh, you know, are probably dying because every people like to look at everything online now. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that's not going to happen to to books. You know, it could easily. I mean, people tend to. We all sit at home on our computers and look at people's websites and look online. And um, I think young people often would just soon do that as anything else. But then there's also another thing, which is you know, vinyl has come back and. You know, mm -hmm. it's like there, there is the, you know, it, young people are photo using film again to photograph. Mm -hmm. And so there is something wow. retro and, and maybe um, about the book for people that I think um, is a hook and let's hope it will last because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, how can right. you be uh, a photo book as an object? Well, I know, I know when, when the internet started making a lot of books available, I was skeptical at, at, at best um, because I thought, well, I don't want to purchase a book that I haven't had the opportunity to feel, or look at, or, you know, smell or check the weight of, or, you know, open the dust flap on, you know, all those ways that you want to interact with a book. Somehow though, I've been able to uh, uh, suspend disbelief and order things and be very gratified. Yeah. Um, I mean, only once in a while do I get something that is a is a disappointment. I mean, maybe one out of 50, maybe one out of 100 books, you know, right. Like that just, you know, that's a failure of a book. Well, I think because now they have the things like look inside this book and you can you can at least flip through it a little bit, which is great. It's a start. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And photography is so uniquely s suited for book work. Um, because it it suffers in some in some ways it suffers the least uh, in the translation from print to ink. Right, that's true. I mean, one of the things that that publishers I think have a hard time with is used to be people would just go in bookstores and flip through and you know spend half an hour looking at a photo book and then they didn't need to buy it. And so um, mm. you know there was always that fear of like how do we what's the hook to make people mm -hmm. take this home and well the pandemic. The pandemic helped with that, <laughs> yeah. And I think I think if you can, you know, I think text helps with that. I mean, if you, it's important to get, you know, I think like Sai Montgomery wrote this beautiful essay for Peaceable Kingdom, and she's just terrific. Um, her book uh, Soul of an Octopus and uh, the Good Good Pig. Uh, she's such a good writer. Um, and that, and then I also because I interviewed people, I think the stories in the back. Hopefully, someone looking at it in a bookstore would would want to take it home so they could read the whole thing but mm -hmm. um well i think your 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 photographing and your bookmaking show a wonderful quality of even handedness i think you 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 weigh the the elements within within the worlds that you're looking at and come out with a very a very balanced perspective you know there's nothing histrionic about your images at all you know Fascinating things are lurking in all the corners, and you know the the ability to read them on a plane, you know, is is just so delightful. And and so I I I find the 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 even handedness, the even keeled quality of your work to be really calming, soothing in a way. Oh, okay. Well, that's 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 a very interesting observation. Thank you. Sure. Um, I wanted to say, you know, just how much I admire your work. And I was so excited when I saw you, you know, publishing new work, but then also going into your archive. Because, of course, I have an archive, too. And but I wondered, you know, well, and also, excuse me, and I'm just going to digress for a second. I think the even handedness has to do with the lighting. Um, 
in all the books. Um, but I guess my question is, so how do you do that? You know, working on something, it's, it's a lot of work to go back, you know, go back to past work and pull it together. And at the same time, you're still doing work in the present. Yeah, that's true, but I'm not teaching anymore. And um, I'm not doing much freelance work anymore. I basically, about eight years ago, I decided, you know, okay, I, I have all these projects and I would, you know, I really want to make something of them. I want to make books of them if I can. So even though I'm, I'm, I'm still photographing, um, but, I, but, you know, I've given up certain kinds, you know, I've given up the teaching and I've given up the freelance work um, so that I have more time to do it. And because you're right, you, you can't do everything. I mean, if you're, if you're teaching mm -hmm. full time, it's hard even to photograph, you know, and except in the summer. So it's, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, but I, I guess I feel like the deadline of, you know, getting older and, and uh, you know, I want, I want to sort of have closure on some of these projects. Yeah. Um, well, Sage, speaking about closure, um, <laughs> here's a nice segue for us. Uh, it is 7.01. I am so thrilled that we have had this chance to hang out and banter together. Um, I appreciate everyone stopping in on what must have been a busy Thursday evening. Um, and just a reminder that you can, I would be happy to accept donations to the cause um, via Venmo and join us again next month, please, for Stuart Rome on December 14th. Sage, thank you again. I'm pleased to be in touch. And thank you, Sage. Thank you, everyone. Thank for you all. Me. And thank you all for coming and, and being here. And George, thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, thank you both. Soon. Bye now. Bye. Wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks.